Hey all, Ron Coddington here from Military Images Magazine with today's episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. This morning, I was out in Idaho Territory uh, investigating a unique image that I scanned a few weeks ago. It's um, part of the collection of Al Nemec. And um, there's a lot of eye candy here to grab your attention. We have a young man who is wearing a heavy coat, pants, uh, knee-high boots. Uh, he's got gloves on. He has a fur cap. If you look closely at his coat, you will see uh, a single brass button. Uh, the other buttons are covered by the scarf he's wearing around his neck. Um, and the, the, the big item, which is sort of a telltale, uh, telltale item, is the gun that he's holding. It's a Colt revolving rifle. He's standing in a studio, as you can tell by the walled backdrop, uh, the molding, and the flooring. So it's really quite an interesting image. And you're, my first thought is uh, this is definitely Civil War period. Uh, it's a carte de visite, which for those of you who are new to uh, photograph collecting, um, was popular during the Civil War period. And this particular image has a gold, a double gold line border, which was popular, it was a popular mount on which these images were pasted. So, uh, and also they're about the size of a, a modern baseball card. So um, we have this really interesting image here. What's more, or I would say equally compelling, is we've got some information on the back of the photograph. And um, here's, here's what it says. Uh, I also, I want to point out here that the image was uh, probably in an album at some point um, or stacked up in other images. And you can see where the image that was behind it is grafted, uh, I guess, rubbed off a little bit on the back. So it appears to be a young woman or man who is imprinted. Um, it's obscuring the pencil text, but you can clearly see the pen inscription at the top, which says the Idaho Gorilla about 1865. The rest of the writing in pencil uh, says uh, Quincy A. Scott in Colorado when he got the gold nuggets from which the wedding rings of Jenny Watt Scott, Jane Scott Fisher, and Quincy A. Scott were made. Now, that's an interesting bit of information. Uh, and if you are a photo sleuth, you are thinking, wow, I've got some real clues that I can dig into here. And it was pretty easy for me to find out a little bit more about Quincy A. Scott. In fact, my first stopping point was Ancestry.com. I typed in Quincy A. Scott. I estimated a birth year um, of 1841 because I thought, oh, and I also did a, um, a spread of 10 years. So I thought this, this man was probably born sometime in between the 1830s, maybe the 18, later 1840s, depending upon when this photograph was made. He certainly looks like a young man. So I put a widespread into Ancestry.com. And um, sure enough, I was able to find out some, I was able to confirm some information here. His name, in fact, his full name is Quincy Adam Scott. And for those of you have, who have done genealogical research and are familiar with American names from the 19th century, the earlier part of the 19th century, being named for presidents is a fairly common, or famous statesman is a fairly common um, uh, move by parents. Just check out the number of George Washingtons uh, that uh, you'll find in early census records, and you'll know what I mean. So here we have Quincy Adams Scott. Um, he was born in 1841. That was just a crazy coincidence. I guessed 
1841, and he was born in 1841, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the son of a dentist, uh, and he doesn't live long. He dies in 1879 when he's about 28 years old. But he's a highly, um, highly productive uh, man. He marries and has uh, three children. And guess what? The names of his wife, Jane, and his children match the names on the back of this image. So we've made an important connection. We were able to confirm his name, Quincy Scott, able to get his middle name, Adams. We we're able to connect his wife and his children to the individuals listed on the back of the mount of this photograph. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty confident that we have our man. Um, so uh, all connected to Pittsburgh. He was born in Pittsburgh. He dies in Pittsburgh. So how is it that he has the name Idaho Gorilla and a reference to Denver, Colorado, or pardon me, not Denver, but Colorado, on the back of the photograph. Well, I'm not able to find an easy explanation in the time that I spent this morning looking around, but I can tell you this. Sometimes the absence of information is suggestive. So considering his age, born in 1841, he would have been 20 years old when the Civil War began. And so many men, young men of military age, had some connection to the military. Um, and so my next stop was to go to the Civil War database and to Fold 3 to look for Quincy Adams Scott or Quincy A. Scott. And guess what? I found no military record. So that lack of information suggests to me that he had no connection at all to the military. Now it's possible that his name is, was misspelled or a different spelling. He may have served under an alias. All of that is worthy of exploring. But my preliminary assessment is that he did not have military service. So where was he during that time? Where was he between 1861 and 1865? Not exactly clear. Um, however, think about this. If he did not have military service, and if the military draft, which occurred in 1863, touched him, one possible explanation is that he took off for the West and somehow landed in Colorado, and then later on, Idaho Territory. This would connect with the quote, the inscription on the back of the photograph, the Idaho gorilla. So I did a search on newspapers.com for Idaho gorilla, and I spelled gorilla, G-O-R-I-L-L-A, G-O-R-R-I-L-L-A, G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A, all the variations on the spelling, and um, came up empty. So I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. So then I went to Google and just did a basic search for the Idaho gorilla. And sure enough, I got one, count them, one hit. Uh, and it's a reference to a newspaper that was founded in Warren, Idaho Territory about 1864. Uh, and it's called the Idaho gorilla. Uh, and, um, and so the other detail is that Warren, Idaho is described as mining country. So is it possible that our young man here, Quincy Adams Scott, left Pittsburgh and went on a boyhood young man adventure out to Colorado and then Idaho Territory? Um, did he work as a miner in Colorado and find the diamonds? that he ultimately had made into rings for his wife and children? Did he somehow come into possession of the diamonds in some other way? Maybe he wasn't mining. Maybe he was, maybe he was a gambling man. I have no idea. All of that remains to be investigated right now. Just pure speculation. Uh, did he possibly go from Colorado to 
Idaho territory. Did he get a job at the Idaho gorilla? Was he somehow connected with that? Did he provide, maybe he sold some of those diamonds to get a stake in the local newspaper? We don't know. All this is worthy of further explanation. Um, but this morning, I was able to take the story of Quincy Adams Scott as far as I'm sharing with you today. So more work to be done, but a really interesting image with an unusual backstory. And as always, it's a work in progress. So we'll continue digging. If you know anything about Quincy Adams Scott, the Idaho gorilla, Idaho territory, mining in Colorado and connection to diamond rings for his family, um, leave a comment. Anyway, we'll be back with a new episode. Until then, happy trails.